Hey, all right, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Here we are in uh, Giza. You can see the one of the great pyramids behind me right now. Um, and I'm going to uh, I'm gonna go ahead and read chapter six of Amara, Daughter of the Nile. Uh, we know now that she has to serve two masters, Sheftu and the mysterious stranger. And um, it's kind of like a double spy. She's going to try to be the messenger. And she's also hired to find the messenger. So she is the messenger and she has to find the messenger, if you understand what that means. Okay, so let's get into it. She's going to Abydos to find Sanguine to give him the scarab needle uh, so that she can be transformed into someone above suspicion so she can become Princess Anani's um, interpreter. And she's going to keep the ring that Sheftu gave her for the payment. So she's going to keep that. All right. Chapter six, Frightened Princess. Sanguine proved to be a squat, middle-aged man with a stupid face and eyes that seemed half asleep. He barely looked at Mara when she showed him the scarab and asked for instructions. Interpreter, I, I, I remember now. You're to find the inn of the lotus. It's close by, just yonder, where you see the donkey turning into the alley. They've got their orders there. Mention my name. Mara started in the direction he indicated, glancing about her curiously. The wharfs of Abydos were not so different from those of, at Minfi. Though the traffic had an unfamiliar character, there was less merchandising here, fewer foreign vessels. Instead, there were funeral barges. Uh, she counted eight on the harbor this morning. Abydos was the most ancient and sacred of all cities. The god Osiris himself was thought to be buried here, and all who could afford it arranged for their funeral processions to make pilgrimages from their own cities to this gate of the underworld before the final ceremonies of entonement. So you just learned something about Egypt, that it was Abydos that everybody um, would go to, many of them, to for their final uh, entonement. The end of the lotus was easy to locate since it had a carved wooden flower swinging over its doorway. Mara entered, identified herself to the vacant-faced woman in charge, and was directed up an outside staircase. In the room above, a coal-black slave girl awaited her. Mara discovered almost immediately that she was deaf and dumb, meaning she could not uh, hear and she could not speak. She could not hear and could not speak. Thoughtfully, she followed the girl into an adjoining bath chamber where great jars of water stood about the walls uh, and the stone floor sloped to a center drain. The queen's man had made very sure, the mysterious stranger we're talking about, had made very sure of secrecy in this process of transforming her from a ragged slave into a person above suspicion. The woman downstairs was vague and stupid. The one, uh, this one, was deaf and dumb. I mean, dumb as in can't speak. And St. Quinn himself, incurious. All the better for me, reflected Mara, remembering the menace in Sheftu's voice that morning when he had warned her against trickery. The silver beetle was to loiter upriver until noonday when the barge of the princess should overtake it. After seeing for themselves that Mara was safely on board, Sheftu and Nakak would proceed to Thebes and she would be free to carry out her own plans. She frowned. It gave her a little pleasure to think about those plans. She turned her attention instead to the enjoyable menstruations of the black slave girl. The jars of water were poured over her. Her hair was cleansed and trimmed, and her body rubbed with scented unguents until it glowed. Then, leading her back into the first room, the slave pointed to a little carved chest that stood in one corner. Mara opened its lid, and the last of her uneasy humor vanished. 
There were piles of snowy linen, leather sandals. She had never owned sandals in her life, even the common sort woven of palm fiber. There were a few pieces of jewelry, colored sashes, a warm white woolen cloak, deeply fringed. There was a whole wardrobe in that chest, even to the pots and vials containing scents and cosmetics. It was not too lavish. It was scaled perfectly to the needs of a priest's daughter, the role Mara was to play. But to her, it was unimaginable luxury. And as she shook the garments out one by one and looked at them, she felt again the fierce determination that nothing, nobody must stand in the way of her possessing such things always, freedom and gold and a life worth living. Gardens with lotus blooming in the fish pool, roast duck and honey on air on the table, rows and rows of papyrus scrolls on the shelves in a beautiful room. So she did, so she dreamed as the black girl dressed her in the ankle length sheath of white linen, secured the wide straps over her bare brown shoulders, and wound a cinnamon colored sash twice about her waist looping it in front so that the ends fell luxuriously to her sandals. Her hair was combed to glossy smoothness, scented and delicately oiled. Her eyelids were properly painted, with brows and lash lines elongated almost to her temples. There were gold bands for arms and ankles, too, and a broad collar formed of cylindrical beads enameled the same deep radiant blue as her eyes. She put away the little copper mirror at last with a sigh of content. It had been a long time since she had enjoyed even the near necessity of eye paint, which all Egyptians, men and women, considered essential to a decent appearance. And the rest was elegance undreamed of. The sandals did pinch a little, of course, where the strap pressed up between her toes, and the high curling tips would uh, trip her if she didn't watch out. She was not accustomed to such grandeur. Never mind, she would grow accustomed to it. Only a gutter snipe went barefoot. Remember, that, that word keeps coming up because that's what Sheftu called her. Following, or I'm sorry, followed by the slave who padded silently behind her carrying the chest, she returned to the wharf. St. Gwen was now sitting on a folding stool on the deck of the princess's barge, staring apathetically at the cooks moving about on the attendant kitchen boat, uh, which was moored nearby. Mara glanced up, shading her eyes. Let down a ladder, please. He turned toward her, then leaned over the gunwale, his sleepiness gone. You're the interpreter? He asked uncertainly. Yes. The same one? Of course, I identified my, myself not half an hour since. Aye, aye. His thick lips curled in a smirk, but you look different now. Indeed. Mara gave him a perfunctory smile, careful neither to offend nor encourage him. She did not wish him to remember her longer than was strictly necessary. Will you let down the ladder? She repeated. He hastened to obey when the stool, I'm sorry, when she stood beside him on the deck, her head held high, her eyes cool, he stopped gaping and became more respectful. Oh, the princess and her train will return soon. You're to wait in there. I'll stow your chest. Very well. As the slave woman walked across the wharf and out of her life as silently as she had come into it, Mara made her way to the pillared pavilion, which occupied most of the deck space of the barge. There was space on each side for 12 oarsmen, but there was another mast, uh, but there was neither mast nor sail. And the captain's cabin had been removed in order to enlarge the quarters occupied by Inani, and her women. Mara pushed aside one of the hanging carpets that formed the pavilion's walls and stepped in. The first thing she did was kick off the unaccustomed sandals. Then comfortably barefoot, she began to look about her. Dazzled by the sunlight outside, she could not at first distinguish one object from another in the shadowed interior. 
But as her eyes grew accustomed to the gloom, she began to make out couches and low tables, clothing, boxes, and all the feminine hodgepodge of trinkets, mirrors, jewelry, and scents necessary to an entourage of a dozen women. The better she could see all this, the more astonished she became. She stepped quietly about the place, examining with curiosity and not a little revulsion the same or the strange possessions of these barbarians. How different they were from anything Egyptian. The jewelry was crude and tasteless, the boxes uncarved, and she scattered clothing and the scattered clothing so vulgar in its gaudy colors that Mara's civilized Egyptian nose wrinkled disdainfully. All clothing should be white. In Egypt, even a slave knew that much. We're just talking about the differences between people. Remember, the Canaanites thought that the Hebrews or the Hittites were uncivilized in many ways. And now here, the Egyptians are looking down at the Canaanites thinking they're uncivilized. Except for the furniture, which, like the barge, had been built in Thebes, there was nothing in the pavilion which looked as if it might have any connection with a high-born princess. Princess, scoffed Mara inwardly, probably some shepherd's daughter whose father bullied a few neighbors into calling him king. Turning her back on the untidy room, she stretched full length on one of the couches and fell to wondering what life might be like in Pharaoh's palace. She had not long to wait before the cries of a runner, a beck, a break, take care, take heart to thyself warned her that the train of the princess was approaching, not a train like a choo-choo train like that, nothing. It just means like a, a group uh, procession. Hastily groping for her sandals, Mara listened as the hubbub reached the water's edge. St. Quinn barked an order evidently for the bearers to set down the litters and allow the women to emerge. For in a moment, the air was filled with the sibilant mumbling of Babylonian. As the women filed on board, it sounded as if a hundred great bumblebees had been loosed on deck. Mara Rosen, walking to the carpet wall of the pavilion, pushed a hanging aside and stepped out. She found herself face to face with the Canaanite princess. At first glimpse, Mara could not help smiling. Anani was overfed and dumpy with untidy brown curls clinging damply to her forehead and escaping here and there from the long shawl she wore over her head. Half smothered and sweating in her bulky woolen draperies, which swathed her from head to toe and were striped and embroidered all over in garish colors. She looked every inch the gawky barbarian, but her eyes moved Mara to sudden pity. They were enormous, timid, frightened dark eyes and they stared at the Egyptian girl as they must have stared at countless strange faces and customs that had come up to bewilder her in this foreign land. Who are you? She whispered helplessly. Your interpreter, Highness, returned Mara in Babylonian, smiling more sympathetically this time and dropping briefly to one knee. Inani's relief at hearing a familiar tongue spoken by one of these arrogant Egyptians was pathetic. She gave a great sigh of pleasure and turned excitedly to the dozen gaudily clad and perspiring serving women who huddled behind her. It is an interpreter. She speaks Babylonian, she cried, as if they could not hear for themselves. And at that, all the plump faces lighted up. And those who understood Babylonian turned in to explain the joyful news to those who spoke only their local dialects. And for a while, nothing at all could be heard except their excited jabbering. At last, though, Inani gestured them to silence and turned eagerly to Mara. Oh, please, she begged, find out from that man there who commands this ship if we may leave this place soon and row on to Thebes so long. Have we been on this river so many, many tiresome days, and no one explains anything? And a week now we have been in the temple yonder, while the priests mumble strange things over us and make us wash and wash and wash until we are like to drown. What is it all for? Are we never to leave off traveling and washing? 
Patience, my princess, soothed Mara, stifling a grin. I can answer your questions without talking to St. Gwen. Any foreigner journeying to Pharaoh's palace must undergo the ceremonies of purification. But it is over now. We leave immediately, and before another night and day, we will moor in Thebes. Ah, thanks be to beautiful Ishtar. Thanks to Baal in his temple. Come, let us go in out of the sun. I am like to die of heat. Still chattering like a congregation of peahens, the women swarmed inside and, safe now from masculine eyes, began to shed their thick shawls and scarves and cloaks and to fling themselves panting on couches. I shall never grow used to this climate, groaned the princess, running her hand through her sweat-dampened hair. And I'm told that it is far hotter in the season of flood. How do you live under such a sun? And we dress for it, Mara pointed out in amusement. We too would smother and gasp for air in those heavy, heavy woolens. We wear, only, we wear wool only at night when the air is cold. You will find yourself more comfortable, my princess, when you possess an Egyptian wardrobe. And Nani glanced at Mara's bare shoulders and sheer narrow garments and blushed crimson. Oh, I could never wear those things, she gasped. Shocking! My brothers told me this was a dangerous and wicked land, for all that the temples are paved with silver. Mara laughed outright at this. We are not wicked, only sensible. You may grow wise, too, after a summer spent on the Nile. She refrained from adding that it would also be well for Inani and her women to grow thinner, both for coolness uh, and fashion's sake. The vision of these fat Syrians in uh, the narrow Egyptian sheaths filled her with mirth, so she's kind of laughing inwardly. Almost at once, they could hear St. Gwen's bellowed orders and the bustle of casting off. In a short time, the barge was maneuvered through the funeral traffic in the harbor, and as they picked up their speed, the open river and cool north breeze began to drift through the pavilion. Most of the Syrians went gratefully to sleep, but for some time Inani kept Mara busy with questions about Egypt and the king and the golden palace for which they were headed. Mara gave what answers she knew and glibly invented the others. But finally the princess too dropped into an uneasy slumber and Mara rose and tiptoed out to the open deck. The fragrance of roasted meat from the attendant kitchen boat had warned her that noonday was near. Standing at the prow, shading her eyes against Ra's dazzling beams, she soon located the silver beetle standing off the west bank. As she watched, the broad sail rose rib by rib like a gigantic fin, and the vessel moved into the middle of the stream. The closer it came, the faster Mara's heart pounded. She searched its trim decks, so familiar to her and yet somehow different and strange because she stood apart from them now. She spotted Nakonk bellowing some order up into the rigging and could almost feel the tug in her own body as the wind filled the sail. And at last she saw Sheftu, a still sun-flooded figure with his face in shadow, leaning with that deceptive laziness. Deceptive laziness means like it looks lazy, but he is anything but lazy. He is aware of everything. Of that deceptive laziness near the great sweep at the stern, he gave no sign, nor did she, though for a moment they could have almost clasped hands over the narrow stretch of green water between them. Then slowly, the distance widened as the beetle gathered speed and drew ahead of the more ponderous barge. Not until the sail grew small in the distance did Mara turn back to the shadowy pavilion, feeling lonely and unreasonably depressed. Soon she would walk the gleaming pavements of the golden house, Pharaoh's palace, but soon also, she must face her second meeting with that new master, the mysterious stranger, the one that bought her to find the messenger. She is now the messenger. But if she tells him, hey, Sheftu's the one, then she gets gold and freedom. 
the war hawk is coming. It meant nothing to her, but no doubt it would to the granite-jawed one, the mysterious stranger. Ah, oh, gods of Egypt, what a little time Sheftu had to live. So it sounds like she made up her mind. She's going to go tell her mysterious stranger, the granite-jawed guy, she's going to tell him that Sheftu is the one. Sheftu is the one that sends the messenger back and forth from uh, Thutmose. He's the one trying to overthrow Hatshepsut, and then they will kill uh, Sheftu. That's the plan right now. All right. Well, I'm getting, I don't seem to be getting any closer to the pyramid, and I'm, that's where I'm headed. So I'm, I might get off this thing and start walking. It might be faster that way. All right, guys, have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. Take care.